Sorry. It's Monday, which means it's jazz day. Um, of course, in fairness, what day isn't jazz day? Welcome back to, this is now lecture 24 of uh, machine design. It has been quite the semester. Uh, we have... We <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, we have been uh, through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, a lot of uh, frustrations. Thank you, COVID. Um, things didn't quite go the way that I was hoping to in this class, and I know nobody was hoping this semester uh, would go this way, but here we are. It's the now second week of November, and uh, classes are over. Two weeks from today, uh, you will be taking the final for this class. So, uh, I mean, we're there. Why do I feel like this camera is pointed downward? Oh, it's probably because the camera is pointed downward. Huh. Crazy. I mean, who would have thought that? Explains so much. There we go. That's better. So, yeah. Um, what we're going to talk about in class today uh, is we have two different topics that we're going to be covering. Um, please note that what we're about to cover in this lecture is, again, not something that I'm not, I'm going to give you a homework assignment over. Um, when it comes to mechanisms and movement, uh, let's say we have, uh, some very simple, uh, let's, maybe a scotch yoke mechanism. And a scotch, uh, in a scotch yoke mechanism, you have a crank, and that crank, uh, goes inside of a slider. Okay, and this slider has maybe a mechanism uh, that allows this to. Here's a maybe a linear bearing or something, uh, but it allows it to slide in and out uh, as this crank rotates. And this crank is mounted to the ground. So just moving very simply, um, no, it's, it's a, it's a scotch yoke. It, it just really quickly. Um, what, what we see in a mechanism like this is if we're going to go down and look at the actual power transfer for a mechanism like this, I guess I should write title of today's lecture. Um, if we're looking at a mechanism like this, the kinds of stresses that it, it's going to be experiencing depends on position, depends on speed, uh, it, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, just by looking at a static analysis, which so far in this class all we've done has been static analyses, um, you have this component here, you've got the slot inside, and you've got a pin. Okay, let's say the crank is currently spinning this way, which means you have a contact force right here, where what's happening is that pin is butting up against that slot side. Contact really only occurs on one side. You don't have a pull force on the other side of the slot. Okay, this pin in the slot isn't, it's not pulling. You don't experience a force over here. All of the forces exist as contact forces uh, right there. So, the location of those stresses, the, the magnitude of those stresses do change uh, based on how this is going. Now, as you would have looked at in doing your uh, mechanism power transfer diagrams, um, the crank itself is experiencing some kind of a constant torque, uh, T. Okay, and the amount of force in this direction, which by the way is the amount of force that goes in this direction uh, is a variable, okay? Your torque T is producing some kind of a torque uh, where your force is equal to 
the force in this direction is equal to this distance, d, uh, t divided by that distance. Okay, so when the crank is all the way at 90 degrees, this way or 180 degrees, I should say, or 90 degrees, sorry, zero degrees or 180 degrees, this completely this way or completely this way, uh, <laughs> your force, your D value goes to zero, your torque value still exists, and the force transmission goes to near inf infinite. Um, now that is awesome when it comes to power transfer, yes, mega force. Is, uh, bring out the Power Rangers. Um, but it's really bad when it comes to stress analysis because having an infinite force transmission means uh, theoretically that this is going to smash your Scott Choke mechanism. Uh, now that doesn't really happen. Um, but uh, in theory, uh, that, that is what happens. Um, so looking at, at the forces through here, it does change with orientation, okay? So your forces change with, first of all, your torque on your crank, or whatever your power generating mechanism is, could be a force, uh, ultimately comes with, from the power generating mechanism. Um, your forces also change with orientation. Um, I said it, it changes with speed. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so speed. Contact dimensions. Materials. Okay, if your pin is made out of a certain material, uh, it's going to transfer forces differently. And you may have uh, a very, very hard pin um, will tend to transfer forces such that the distribution is more centered. A uh, softer pin will tend to distribute the forces a little bit less spiked in the middle, a little bit more across the entire diameter, uh, well, across the entire contact surface. So it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's something where, uh, your, your forces have a lot of variables associated with them. Um, and that's where, uh, that's where determining static analysis is a lot easier. Um, but the purpose of this class is not talking about static analysis. If we fix this and we apply an, an absolute torque, we can use our geometric calculations, figure out vectors. We can come up with stresses in this component. We can do it by hand. Awesome. Uh, but that's not realistic. And in fact, this type of situation tends to be something that most people don't do by hand. Uh, and yes, I made you do power calculations. Yes, I made you do power flow calculations by hand. That's because you need to know how to do them. Um, those power flow calculations they can be good in dealing with very low speed uh, systems. Low speed systems, you fix one point on your system and you see how, what happens to the stresses throughout your entire system. You do that, it's actually a good representation of understanding where your critical points are, understanding potential failure points, understanding critical orientations. Uh, maybe your maybe you're crank at a 90 degree angle is the most critical orientation for your system, causes the highest stresses, okay? You use that, you figure out the stresses from there, and you use that in your fatigue calculations. So that's important by itself. Uh, but a lot of that stuff, I mean, this is the reason why we came up with finite element simulation software. Um, it's because this is, it's a lot of work to try to do by hand. And if you start adding in, all of these different changing elements, now suddenly this becomes more ridiculous. This goes from, uh, wow, okay, I did this awesome static force transfer, power transfer problem by hand, to now, oh, heck no, um, I value my sanity, and 
I value things that are good in this world. Uh, and this is not one of those things. So what I'm talking about in this lecture specifically is not something I'm expecting you to do because quite frankly, not even SOLIDWORKS uh, can handle this type of analysis. This does require software like LSDyna, um, Abacus, uh, those types of, of very large packages that are very pricey. Um, oftentimes that run off of a Linux based system and require supercomputers to run. Um, and I'm not going to, we, there's no way we could teach that in this class. Uh, it, it takes multiple classes to learn those types of programs after understanding the materials in this class. Uh, so the fact that we can just use SOLIDWORKS to give, give us nice answers, that's fine. And we're not going to be doing dynamic analysis. We're not going to be doing it even for, uh, even for the final project. But the important thing to note is this is what's going on. So as we look at this scotch yoke mechanism, as it's moving forward and backward, um, accelerating one way, accelerating the other way, um, it's a lot like a game of football. You go this way, you go that way, you go this way. Great defense. Woo team. Um, if, if this entire mechanism was made out of aluminum, it would experience different kinds of stresses than it would if it was made out of cast iron. And yeah, I mean, it, some of it has to do with contact, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that aluminum is a lot lighter than uh, cast iron. If you take your fist and in your fist you hold, um, I'm just grabbing a nearby object, this, okay, is a fairly large block. Um, some of you made this, Tyler Sherrill, uh, which by the way I'm using in my Engineering 101 class again, so thank you. Uh, if I use this and I accelerate this quickly, uh, in, a, in a cyclic fashion, um, I'm going to have a lot of force that my, my arm has to exert. In order to go faster, it increases the accelerations and it requires a lot more force out of here. This is why boxers have to be really strong because you have to accelerate your fist really quickly and come back and go back again. Uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of muscular effort. Um, the, the heavier an object is, the harder it is to accelerate, okay? That's just Newton's basic second law. Whoop, that's an N. F equals MA. If we increase the mass of our component, then as it accelerates, we're increasing the force required to accelerate it, okay? And uh, if you remember from... 350, or those of you who are in 350 right now, uh, this is an inertial component where you are storing energy in kinetic energy. And the amount of work that's being done by this force is the work required to increase or decrease or change uh, that energy. Now, having a high inertia is great for when you have impact forces on this side. Uh, if you're doing something like building an auto hammer or uh, for doing forging, you want to have some inertia here because it, it provides that punch. Uh, it, it can handle a lot more impact loading, there's more momentum transfer, all of that. But you have a substantial change in kinetic energy. And that happens because you have mass in these components. Simply because these components have mass, they all will experience a dynamic stress. Okay, we tend to assume that the mechanisms we're dealing with are operating at very low speeds. Uh, why is that? Because at a very low speed, your acceleration value is very small and the force required to uh, overcome that acceleration is very small. Now, this isn't the only guiding equation. You also have to deal with, you have a torque caused by a rotation of a device, okay? Every time this crank rotates, there is a torque associated 
with causing this to spin. Why is that? Because you're accelerating these components out here at a much faster rate than you're accelerating these components over here. This doesn't move very fast. This moves very fast. And its velocity vector is changing constantly because here in this orientation, it's facing this way, and the next one's facing this way, and the next one's facing this way. Your velocity vector is changing. That is an acceleration. The net value of that acceleration points inward, which means you have a force that is actually holding it together. Um, but still, you have an acceleration due to this piece spinning. And a, there is a torque associated with causing it to spin. Now, if it spins any faster, that's what alpha is, if it rotates faster, that will come with a torque, a resistance to this torque. If we have, instead of going with a, a scotch yoke mechanism, let's say we go with a four bar linkage. Okay, the alpha value of the rocker is associated with an inertial value. Okay, this has some inertia to rotate. It takes some amount of torque to cause this to accelerate. And you do have some power loss in that situation. This crank is pushing it this way. Some of that force is being used to increase the kinetic energy of your rocker. That's just, it happens. Um, and as that kinetic energy is, is absorbed, what that's doing is it is actually incurring stresses on the rocker. You don't dump energy into a component without having stresses uh, associated with that. Change in energy always comes with stress. In a mechanical engineering world, that happens. In fact, in every world, that happens. Electrical stress, uh, hydraulic stress, change in energy always is associated with some stress. Uh, and this experiences some stress and acceleration. So if we're just looking at the rocker mechanism here uh, in a crank rocker, you have this here, it's pivoting about this point, which means it's rotating here about this point. You figure out what your omega of time is, which allows you to figure out what your alpha of time is, which is your angular acceleration. You multiply your angular acceleration by the inertia of that component, and you're finding out how much torque about this needs to be created. Okay, how much torque needs to be created is a product of a vector that is perpendicular to your rocker multiplied by the distance between that vector and the rotation point. Okay, and that's how much torque is required to make this object operate right off the bat. Okay, just in order to get it to spin at this certain speed, with this velocity, with this acceleration, in order to get this acceleration out of it, we have to apply a certain torque, which means we have to have a certain force transmission. If you reduce that force transmission, uh, you're not gonna be able to accelerate that much, and you're certainly not gonna be, have, be able to have any power output out of this system. Uh, because now it's being entirely absorbed by the movement of your component. Okay, so when it comes to dynamic stresses, okay, anytime you have a rotation in an object like this, your accelerations out here are going to be substantially larger than the accelerations closer to your pivot point. Okay, let's say your rocker goes out like this. The amount of stresses incurred by a rotation in this direction, an acceleration in that direction, are going to be highest at the end. And they're gonna be highest at the end here. And they're gonna be lowest at this point because it, it doesn't move there. There is no velocity at that point. Okay, so the farther you get away from a rotation point, the larger your angular your accelerations are. The larger your accelerations are, if we take a small body and bring it out, that small body is experiencing a very large alpha and has some finite amount of mass in it, 
what you end up with is you're accelerating this mass at some value of it requires a lot of force to do that, okay? You have to have an internal force that's being caused by something that is pushing that mass element to go that acceleration, okay? That force on that element is a stress. That, that, that's how the force is transmitted. Uh, it creates a stress on that small mass element that causes it to accelerate, okay? So anytime you have any acceleration in a system, there are stresses associated with it. And the speed of that stress is, you, you have to go down and you have to break down each individual component. Figure out how much acceleration it is, okay? And your stress, which could either be a sigma or a tau, is generally going to be an acceleration, which is in units of uh, feet per second squared, or meters per second squared, um, and you have uh, some mass element. Well, the problem is that you have some mass element, uh, but it's usually represented as density, okay? And density is given in, uh, here this is what, pounds mass per uh, cubic foot something like that. Um, and if you're trying to come up with, with uh, a stress, your stress is equal to a pound mass foot per second squared um, divided by feet squared. Uh, the units don't quite work out on this to come up with something really nice. Um, so what you end up having to come up with is you have a density, it is accelerating at a certain value, uh, you have to take into account the fact that it's a certain distance away from uh, from your center, and you have to do an integral over that, okay? And there's a lot of math associated with figuring out acceleration stresses. Uh, it's, it's not something that is very straightforward. It does depend on material deformation, because as you move, you're going to be transferring that force needed to cause the acceleration all the way up your rocker arm, the entire length. And as that force is transmitting, it is causing a deformation of the component such that, I mean, if you want to look at it in, in a very grossly exaggerated way, um, you know, if my arm is going to be accelerating in this direction, uh, as it accelerates, it's going to have some play in it that's going to cause the entire member to bend, okay? Uh, now that's, again, grossly exaggerated. You usually can't see that level of, of curvature, but there's a curvature involved. Uh, because you have incremental stresses, uh, oftentimes shear stresses, uh, that are needed to uh, be able to carry that. So the width of your component does matter, the height, the location, okay, you put all of these three together, you can figure out generally what, what shear force is being put on your component to accelerate it uh, in rotation. Now this is, again, just a lot of math. Uh, so what finite element software does is finite element software will do this math for you, particularly at high speeds. Okay, at high speeds, such as if you're designing a rotor for a windmill, or you're designing uh, a very large scale uh, wind turbine, you need to understand the stresses at the tips uh, of those wind turbine blades because those stresses account for something. You will have blade turbines shatter if you do not design them for handling their own accelerations. That is before you even begin to account for wind loading. Okay, having a force way out here at the tip that is associated with an acceleration is a lot of stress that is put through the entire rest of the member because as I said, you have to transfer that force. Simply having an element out here means that you're transmitting more force through this component down underneath it. 
which is, again, part of why this is so hard to calculate. So dynamic stresses are no joke. In very low speed systems, dynamic stresses can be assumed to be zero because your acceleration value is so small. But for larger systems, you do have to put it into a finite element software and you have to figure out how much stress is occurring on each element because of the speed that it's traveling. Uh, so, all right, that's all we're gonna talk about for dynamic stresses. Um, I hope you have a little bit better of an understanding of first of all, what they are, but second of all, why we didn't talk about them yet in class. I uh, left them to the, the very end of the semester. Um, in our next video, we're going to briefly talk about welds. So uh, I guess I'll see you in like three minutes or so. I'm gonna turn on this smooth jazz again. Oh yeah. Someday I wanna be able to play the, play the saxophone like that. All right, I'll see you in a few.